Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast, where we look forward to shaving every day. Welcome to episode 77 of the podcast. My name is Rick DeWeese. I'll be your host this week. This week, we've got a couple of shave of the day experiences that I start out with. I I tell you about my computer situation, and and don't worry, it's all good stuff. I'm not having any problems. In fact, things are going very, very well right now, and I'll tell you why, and a little bit of my history with computers. Some more shave of the days, or perhaps it's just, you know, rantings of a crazy person. I don't know. (laughs) Then I'm going to tell you about... um, uh, I recently got a pair of cowboy boots. Now, th- these cowboy boots have, well, kind of a pseudo history. It's not really the history of these particular boots, but of boots that are, well, kind of like them. And I'll tell you all about that. Finally, I'm going to finish up today with uh, talking about, well, coffee. I haven't talked about coffee in a while, and, well, things have been going on, and I haven't been able to, and, and finally things kind of eased up a little bit, and uh, it, it gave me the ability to sit down, reflect, and enjoy. So I'll tell you all about that. Now, here's something that you may not know, because I haven't talked about it in a while. Um, as many of you know, uh, Mantic59 runs a uh, website, uh, in uh, a blog, and, and just all kinds of other stuff uh, under uh, the name of Sharpologist. And one of the things that he did way long time ago was, well, he wrote a free ebook. And uh, so in the show notes on this episode is a link to the audio version of that ebook. So if you've got somebody that's getting into wet shaving, um, this might be something to download for them on a stick, on a uh, on a USB stick or something like that, or send them the link and uh, let them listen to the free ebook. It is free and uh, it is a good ebook. Anyhow, I thought I'd mention that, and uh, that's kind of what we got this week for for this week's show. I am currently uh, in the midst of uh, a, well a blizzard. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what we'll call it. Um, it's not quite uh, whiteout conditions. In fact, I've got visibility probably easily a thousand feet. Um, but but this is the south, and it is snowing. Oh my gosh, we're gonna die! <laughs> it's really not quite as all as, as bad as all that. And I'm uh, as as the saying goes, firmly ensconced in the uh, in the studio here. And uh, luckily, I have a uh, an adult beverage in my hand, so. All is good with the world. So uh, let's get on with this show, and uh, hopefully you're having a good week as well. Well, we survived record cold last night. <laughs> uh, oh, it's it's tough being in the South in the wintertime. <laughs> I used to live in Idaho, and uh, record cold there was, well, um, <laughs> cold. <laughs> Here it's like it, it if it got down to zero, I think there would be panic in the street and pandemonium. <laughs> um now granted it is cold. It's in the single digits and yeah, okay. I understand that. But uh <laughs> it is funny. Um and and I understand, you know, the houses aren't necessarily built for that kind of weather and you know, people aren't used to it. I get that, but it's it's humorous when you look at the uh at the reactions of people um, depending on where they live and, and what they're used to, you know, uh, you know, when I was, uh, I, I been, I've lived all over the country and, uh, there are some places where, you know, if you get two feet of snow, that's no big deal. There are other places if you get an inch of snow, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, and down here, it's not necessarily the snow. I mean, realistically, that is not the big problem. Big problem here is that you're right on the edge between warm and cold, and it ends up being ice. And uh, I don't care where you are, I don't care who you are, um, if you're trying to get around, maneuver, drive, whatever, on uh, on a sheet of ice that is covering everything, um, yeah, it, it's it's dangerous, it's treacherous, and and I think everybody understands that and agrees with it. It's just. You know, they, they, people like to make fun of us folks down here <clears throat> in the South because, uh, well, you know, we don't know how to deal with, you know, inclement weather. Well, the uh, the inclement weather that we're dealing with is is ice, and uh, that that's the big thing. In fact, this one, this uh, this last snowstorm, 
wasn't too bad because uh, there was a, a layer of ice underneath, but then there was a nice, uh, fairly sticky layer of crust on top. So uh, while it was uh, relatively uh, treacherous in some spots, um, it wasn't very bad overall. And uh, the nice thing about it is it warmed up uh, enough to uh, to melt off, and uh, and then when it refroze uh, everything that night, uh, there really wasn't much left to uh, to cause issues. And there are a few spots, you know, low areas and shaded areas and things like that, where uh, where you had you know pools of water that had collected and and turned into sheets of ice. But for the most part, people you know that are familiar with the areas uh, know where those are and and tend to avoid them or at least go very slowly on them. And uh, so that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, of course, the, the other issue that we have is we have, uh, we have people out here and uh, they, they drive. There are two kinds of people, uh, I've found, that drive uh, in inclement weather, or, you know, on ice and snowstorms and things like that. There are the people that drive ultra, ultra conservatively. And, and you know, they'll be going down a road at five miles an hour. And then there's the other ones who think that they're bulletproof and go down the road at 80. And uh, you know, I'm sorry, but when uh, when there is ice and snow and, and everything else, especially the ice component, um, you know, when you're when, when the again, when the rest of traffic <laughs> is traveling about 25 miles an hour and they come upon somebody that's doing five, uh I'm sorry, but on ice, you you literally cannot stop that fast, you know. And in in bad weather, bad traction, and you come up on them so fast because they're going so much slower than everybody else, uh, and and so that's a that's a problem. And of course, the other ones that uh, that are out there are the ones that think that well, they're absolutely bulletproof, and you know they may have an all-wheel drive car and got airbags all over it, and they don't have a care in the world, and they're driving down the road at 80 miles an hour, and Next thing you know, they're sideways, and uh, and they're sitting there going, "Well, what happened? You know, uh, how'd this happen?" Well, it happened because uh, you are not using your head. <laughs> uh, so uh, so it, it's it's curious, you know, whenever there is a uh, whenever there is a snowstorm or an ice event or anything like that, you know. Granted, I understand people taking precautions, and uh, in fact, right now it's so cold that uh, a lot of the schools and things are on uh, two-hour delays, and and essentially what they're trying to do is uh, is stagger the utility usage um, so that we don't have uh, power outages, because as you can imagine, in in this kind of weather, uh, a power outage, uh, you know, for any uh, length of time could be uh, rather uh, rather disastrous with you know, uh, the ability to freeze pipes and everything else. I mean, you take the inside of a house down to uh, down to 30-some-odd degrees quickly, and, uh, well, bad things can happen. So uh, it's probably a wise idea. It's uh, it's not something that, uh, that I'm going to get upset about, that's for sure. So the shave of the day today, it was interesting. I was, I was kind of uh, looking around the house trying to find, again, my little Mercure... Uh, Bakelite razor, which I put somewhere in an Altoids tin, and and just I can't find it. <laughs> but I did stumble across my my uh, my Omega bore brush, and uh, I, I thought about it, and I th- said to myself, you know, it's been a while since I used my Omega bore brush, and and you know, the last time I used it, I I if I remember correctly, I said, well, it's it's okay, it's not quite as soft as my Samog. But the loft on it, I, the the length of the bristles is just just huge, and it's a really big knot. And I said, well, you know, let's uh, let's do that. Now, uh, the other thing that I did, just well, because is, you know, it, it kind of set me to thinking. I was I was looking at uh, some of my razors and realized that well, I have a, a Gillette uh, Tech, a fat handle Tech. And uh, I remember that previously I had used it and gone, eh, okay, you know, it's not a bad razor. It's uh, it's not a great razor, but it's not a bad razor. And I realized that, you know, I have a bunch of Gillette Silver Blues that are a fabulous blade, at least for me. And so I got to thinking that uh, so far in every razor that I have put a, a Gillette Silver Blue in, um... It has turned it into a very, very nice uh, razor. It's a beautiful combination in most instances. 
and uh, you know it it just it works just so well. It's almost like it's engineered uh, for the uh, for the vintage Gillettes. It's just, I mean, it just it it makes them smoother. It makes them, you know, just a touch less aggressive, but still exceedingly effective tools. So I uh, I said, well, let's uh, let's do this. Let's use the Omega brush. Let's uh, let's use the fat handle tech with a Gillette Silver Blue and see if there is. Uh, if if that combination um, changes my uh, my attitude and uh, makes any kind of difference for me, so I uh, I uh, lathered up some of the uh, the Doctor John's uh, Bon Ami, uh, no, and Bonnie. <laughs> uh, so I lathered up some of the uh, Doctor John's uh, and Bonnie and. Uh, I got a good load on it with the uh as you would expect with a bore brush, you know, the the backbone and the and the stiffness and the well the ability to scratch yeah you know, of the bristles um into the soap. I mean I got a real good load on it. So made an excellent lather in the old salsa bowl and uh the uh you know it it helps that the salsa bowl that I'm using is uh, is textured on the inside with uh with eighty grit sandpaper. And uh, just to just to roughen it up a little bit and give it a little bit of extra, I don't know, texture, grab, whatever, it, it, it helps a little bit in the lather. So uh, I went ahead and did that, a uh, little bit of a teaspoon of water thrown in there and uh, lathered up and uh, made a very nice lather, although it's deceiving because that very nice lather was almost entirely sucked up by the brush. There was a little bit of excess in the bowl, but it was all in that monstrous brush with the monstrous loft that it has. So, you know, not to dismay, uh, because there was plenty there. So went ahead and uh, and lathered up and uh, proceeded to shave, and the, the Gillette Tech, the Fat Handle Tech, with the Gillette Silver Blue Blade was an absolutely outstanding combination. Uh, the, the, the first shave, and you know, the, the interesting thing is, is that in a lot of instances, the first shave is, is just a little bit rougher than the second shave because, you know, the blade really hasn't, I don't know, broken in. And uh, I'm here to tell you, this, the, the shave that I got with that combination is... Uh, is really really nice. Absolutely no irritation whatsoever. A, uh, a you know two pass shave with some touch up. Um, so my normal shave and uh, just excellent excellent shave. Again no irritation whatsoever. Easy gentle. Um, no tugging or anything like that. The the Gillette Silver Blues just do an excellent job at cutting. And uh, so I was. It was almost like I had with the. With the change of blade, it, it the the razor almost became well a a different razor. Um, it became something that was you know, I guess the word that I'm that that, that just jumps to mind is well worthy. <laughs> um, it was a it really was a good shave. It was a it was a good blade. It was a you know a great combination. And again, it it points back to the uh, the the need to uh to determine and to find that correct blade well for you um the uh the blade that that works well for for you and your circumstances for your skin for your razor etc and uh so that's that's one of the things that is important to uh to experiment with and to find the Anne Bonnie soap um from Dr. Johns um, lathered up very, very nicely. Uh, it really did. I found it to be just a little less slick than uh, than the Hydra and the uh, and the Savannah Sun uh, Sunset. Yeah, I think it was Savannah Sunset. Um, just a little less slick than than those two, but uh, but not by much. Um, the cushion, of course, is is excellent, and the 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 thickness of the ladder the the, the ladder the thickness of the lather that was achieved with that uh, with that big old omega bore brush was just 
It's just fantastic. I mean, I can. I, it's it's very easy to understand how those brushes and brushes of that type with the uh, with the very large loft, you know, became staples in a barber shop um, because it was very easy to lather. It was uh, very easy to pl- to to apply, and the ability to get a just yogurt thick um, lather on the face was just well, it was just simple, so uh, very easy to understand how those are how, how those became so popular back in the day, and how they uh, they regain their popularity or are in the process of regaining their popularity now. So good stuff. The uh, the the Aunt Bonnie, you know, a little bit of black tea and and spice and just oh, it's a it's you know it's it's kind of like a bay rum, but well different. And uh, I enjoyed that. It was a very nice, uh, nice scent. Um, you know, good soap, easy to lather. It was very easy to lather. And again, uh, the, the brush helped. But so far, everything that I've lathered, uh, every brush that I've used um, to lather the uh, the Dr. John's has been, uh, well, easy. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing. So the shave went well and uh, finished up with some uh, with some uh, uh, clubman, some some pinot, and uh, just one of those things. I just it just felt right, and uh, I don't know if it's a good scent combination. It didn't seem to uh, nothing seemed to clash too desperately, and uh, so all in all, a great shave this morning. Just for those listeners who care. <laughs> Because I record these podcasts in the truck using uh, Boss Jock, um, and I leave my uh, my microphone and my cables and everything else in the truck, and uh, it has been, well, just a bit, uh, <clears throat> shall I say cold, <laughs> uh, record-setting cold at night. And uh, so I will. Uh, I will tell you that uh, after spending a a record night out in the cold, uh, the cables are stiff everywhere, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it just makes for an interesting uh, event in trying to assemble um, all of the uh, all of the items and accoutrements. That are uh, necessary and needed for a uh, for a podcast uh, segment. So, um, just one of those things where you know you don't think about it normally until uh, until it occurs, and then you go, "Hey, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's an issue." So I'm uh, I'm driving down the road, and it is uh, cold enough in the uh, in the truck that. Uh, I am wearing a gloves, or at least a glove on the hand uh, that I am using to steer with because this steering wheel is cold. I know, I know. You're probably thinking, ah, pff, lightweight, Southerners. <laughs> I get that. And yeah, I have been climatized. You know, I used to live up in Idaho, and, and cold weather was not that big a deal. And now I come down here, and I mean, if it gets down below about 20 degrees, I'm freezing. It's uh, it's really an amazing thing how uh, how easily you get uh, you get climatized to an area. It's uh, it is curious. Anyhow, the uh, the reason that I really wanted to come on this morning was to uh, well talk about the shave of the day, and uh, so let's go ahead and do that. The uh, the shave of the day. Um, I'm still using Doctor John's. I've uh, I'm I broke into a different sample today. Um, I used Hex, and uh, Hex is an interesting thing. I I haven't. It's very difficult for me to describe the uh, the scent of Hex. Now, before I used it, I I didn't go on the website or uh, you know check out. Okay, what what flavor is this? You know, what am I supposed to be smelling? I didn't do that. You know, I just want to every now and then you just kind of go. Okay, let's see what it brings to the table. Well, on its own. Um, you know, I'm I'm not going to have any preconceived notions. I'm just going to throw it up there and see what happens. And so that's what I did. Now, to lather it up, I I again used the uh the Omega bore brush that uh that I'm using and kind of doing a a second take on. 
And, uh, you know, the thing that I can say about the brush, um, it's, uh, it's nowhere near as soft as either my other bore brushes or anything else that I have in my den, quite honestly. I mean, it is the, uh, it is the least soft brush that I have. Now, one of the things that could be attributing to that is that, you know, it hasn't gone through a whole bunch of, of wetting and drying cycles that, well, are required on a bore brush to split the tips. And it's those split tips that, that gives the softness to the brush. Um, so that, that's typically why, you know, when you get a bore brush initially, you're going, uh, what is this? You know, it's, it's not soft. It's, you know, people would rave about this and, and now I've got one and it's just, I mean, what's, what's the big hubbub about? This, uh, th this isn't that nice at all. But what happens is as the, uh, as the bristles themselves, um, soak in water, and uh, they expand and they absorb water into them. And then as they dry, the, uh, the tips or the ends of the bristles actually split. And when they split, they become, well, finer. And it's that fineness that, that gives you the softness. And so when you're breaking in a bore brush, and uh, this is just for bore brushes, when you're when you're breaking them in, um, that's what you're actually doing. You're, you're using it and you are uh, soaking and drying and it's those cycles that split the tips and that's what gives it ultimately its, uh, its, its softness. Now, it will only get soft up to a certain point and then it just kind of you know levels out and that's pretty much where it is. But uh, the Omega bore brush, first off, it's got a huge loft. I mean, this thing is a monster brush. And uh, it's, uh, it's just, it's not soft at this point. It is very much a, uh, a thick bristle bore brush. But it lathers very nicely and it absorbs and holds so much soap. It's just, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, you, you throw the uh, the brush back in the bowl, and if you look in the bowl, it's like okay, there's there's soap on the surface, but there is no buildup of soap whatsoever because it's all in the brush. And of course, when you when you pick up the brush to uh, to lather your face, you look at it, and and it's like a paintbrush that had been dipped in a in a paint can, and it's just there is paint, you know, or lather everywhere throughout the brush and and the brush is now all of a sudden about twice the volume that it originally was because there's there's lather everywhere and uh you know it just it does an amazing job and the the funny thing is is that you know you lather up and when you go for the uh you know for the the lathering for the second pass um i just take it and put it in the brush and swirl it around a little bit not to pick up the the residual soap that's on the on the inside of the bowl, but more to distribute the soap that's in the brush to the well tip of the brush. It's just it, it's really an interesting phenomena. It's uh, you know it's uh, it's it's rather a unique experience. It's just I don't know maybe I'm weird in, in getting into the way that soap flows around inside a brush. <laughs> it's quite possible, <laughs> but. Uh, it is definitely a uh, a a rough brush. I'm I'm not going to say it's it's rough. I that that's a, that's a bit too severe. It's just it's not soft. Um and it also leaves uh interesting patterns when you uh you know when you swirl it it's one thing, you know, when you're applying the lather, but then when you paint brush, which is what I typically do at the end, it it leaves some interesting patterns because of its well stiffness, if you will. So, uh, you know, all in all, good brush. I like the handle on it. I mean, it's a good size handle. You've got a good grasp and everything. And, and the brush in and of itself is really an amazing uh, thing, especially for the, for the price point. I, I don't think the brush cost, but, I, you know, I, I picked it up used for, for 8 bucks. Um, but I think even new, they're less than like 15 So uh, it's not a bad brush. Um, is it as good as a Samog? That, it's different. It is. It is different. I, I. I can't say it's worse. I can't say it's better. It's just. It's different. Um. I'll have to wait and and continue to use it and see if the. Uh, see if the bristles. Uh. You know. Finally split. Uh. There at the ends and see if it gets any softer. But. Uh, 
you know, overall, I'm real happy with it. Now, on to the hex. Um, lathered phenomenally. Again, it's just I'm I'm really intrigued by the uh, latherability of the uh, of the Doctor John soaps. It's uh, it's really been a uh, an interesting thing, you know. They're they're not uh, they're not difficult to lather. At least uh, the you know the stuff that I've got, and I'm thinking that that's uh, uh, quite typical of uh, normal Doctor John's uh, stuff. I've got I've got some samples, is what I have, and uh, so. You know, excellent lather. Um, now, the smell, again, the smell was very hard for me to pinpoint. And I will be the first to admit, I am not a great one at smells. Um, it's, uh, I'm a great one at sounds. I'm not a great one at smells. And granted, there are certain smells that, that take me back uh, through, you know, down memory lane. But uh, but for the most part, um, I have a hard time understanding and picking things out. Now it smelled, um, it, you know, it, it it smelled okay. It was uh, it was good. I mean, it wasn't uh, it wasn't you know excessively perfumey or anything like that. I found it to be a nice, crisp, uh, masculine scent. Um, it didn't mind. It it was very much different than the uh, Savannah Sunset or the uh, or the uh, uh, let's see, Anne Bonny or. Um, or the Hydra. It, it was very different from that. Um, it was, uh, a, you know, kind of had a little bit of a peppery scent to it. Um, but overall, it's good stuff. Now, of course, you know, the the, the, the glide and the uh, protection, uh, you know, the, the, the cushion of the soap was, especially with that, with that boar brush generating such a thick lather. I mean, it was it was literally, you know, it's it, it's about again like putting, you know, grade school paste on your face. You know, it's uh, just just a little bit uh, more uh, fluid than that. But I mean, it's that kind of same thick, uh, you know, stuff. So it's really good. I mean, I really enjoyed that. It's um, it, it was it was good stuff there. Um, good shave. Uh, I used again my fat handled uh, tech with the uh, Gillette silver blue blade in it and. Uh, yeah, the uh the second shave on that blade um very very nice. I mean, it's just phenomenally nice. It's just it's just it's almost relaxing and and you know, again, like I've said before, I I enjoy the Gillette Silver Blue so much because they are so I I don't know what the good word for it is. You know, I was going to say delicate. Um, you know, they're 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 so smooth. Um, it's just, uh, it's a phenomena that I experience, you know, the, 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 the feathers do a good job, but they, they, they just don't seem to be quite as smooth. It's almost like the, uh, the Gillette silver blues in the manufacturing, they have figured out the perfect angle for the, uh, for the razors to, uh, prevent any kind of, uh, irritation at all. And the, uh, the feathers, while they, they they have an angle that cuts perfectly. They they tend to give just a little bit of irritation. So it's it's an interesting phenomenon, and, I, and I'm sure that's what it is. It's the uh, it's the angles um, of the uh, of the grind on the on the blade. At least that's what I would suspect. I, I don't think it would be the coating or anything like that. But heck, I don't know. Uh, I just know that they work and that they uh, they turn what. What in the past I had kind of deemed as a eh, okay razor into a razor that really does a nice job. Um, you know, it's uh, maybe it was a marketing ploy, you know, where they where they designed their blades to work, you know, extra primo good in uh, in their razors. <laughs> if I had a company, heck, I'd do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, use our blades, use our razors. That way, we get the uh, we get the income, and everybody else can well do whatever they do. You know, it's uh, but all in all, it was a it was an excellent shave today. Uh, let's see, finished off with some with some uh, some uh, let's see, vintage. I guess is the best word for it. Vintage how to grow a mustache uh, bay rum with alum in it, and uh, very nice. Um, worked well. I I like that stuff. It's uh, when I run out, I'll uh, I'll pick up some more. Of course, uh, How to Grow a Mustache has been rebranded into uh, Phoenix Accouterments, and uh, so uh, we'll have to go there and, and check out and see what's, uh, what's available. 
And uh, there you go. Anyhow, that's the report for today. Just a quick note, on the computer front, um, after having my, uh, my Mac for, uh, for a while now, um, you know, a couple months anyhow, uh, I have, God, I love that thing. <laughs> Just to give you some background, um, I am, I have been using computers for, well, just about forever. Uh, you know, I remember, I remember in high school, I believe I was a freshman or sophomore when I took my first computer class. And I want to say I was a freshman. And uh, my first computer class was uh, was done on a teletype machine. The server that it was connected to was 30 miles away, and our programs were stored on paper tape. Um, so that, that may give you an idea of, of how long ago that was for uh, those of you old enough to remember uh, that far back. Uh, how I can is just amazing to me. Um, the uh the 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 thing that i remember prominently about that is that when we uh when we <laughs> when we were uh advanced enough <laughs> and when the uh, computer industry was advanced and this is hard to say <laughs> when the computer industry was advanced enough that we our school was graced with a radio shack trs 80 <laughs> we used to call it a trash 80. And uh so here we are uh at the uh, at the peak, <laughs> the pinnacle <laughs> of the uh home computing industry with a uh with a uh, TRS-80. And the thing that was so nice about it was that it had a tape drive, uh cassette tape. So it was still it was still uh serial um, you know, you had to go through the whole tape to uh, get to certain segments and things, but it was at least a tape drive, which was a heck of a lot more durable than the paper. Um, you know, the, the worst thing that you could do is write a big, long program, save it to paper tape, and then have the tape tear, and you couldn't reload your program. You had to start from scratch and retype it all in. It just sucked. So the uh, the advent of the cassette as a method of storing uh, uh, you know programs and things was a phenomenal advancement. So really like that. Of course, uh, then we uh, we stuck with that and we eventually got a, a floppy disk for it. It was a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. Now, meanwhile, my mom was uh, was also uh, into computers at the time, and uh, she. Uh, she actually built, I think, I want to say it was a, as a Western Digital. I, I can't remember the exact brand. I, I want to say she told me way back when it was a Western Digital. might have been somebody different. But she built um, a, uh, I think it was an 8-inch or 8.5-inch floppy drive for a computer that she was putting together, which was, you know, about one step up from the, uh, from the original Altar 8080. You know, it had the switches on the front that you had to put in uh, 8-bit bytes. You know, you had to uh, program it with the switches on the front. It's just <laughs> yeah, that was back in the Stone Age. You know, it's amazing to me when we, uh, when we look around at where we've come from and where we are now. It's like, holy cow. The, uh, you know, the next step up in computing power for me was a, uh, was a Commodore 64, a little all-in-one unit. Again, started out with the, you know, it came with a tape drive, and, and you're thinking, oh, yeah, that's good stuff. And then you spent the extra money for the uh, for the floppy disk. And uh, so I had a floppy disk drive on it. And the uh, the thing that was interesting is that it was an all-in-one. It was about 60 bucks or thereabouts. And, uh, you know, back then, all of the, all of the little components were, uh, you know, the, the, the things that the computer did, even as far as the character generator for the screen display was uh you know typically in in a lot of the the bigger computers it was a separate component there was actually a character generator card and uh so you know here I am using my commodore 64 and my character generator went out so every time you typed a letter instead of having the letter come up there would be a box where the letter would be except it was you know the ant races the static the uh you know we used to call them ant races when, uh, when when that happened, because the character generator had gone out, and so it wasn't generating characters. It was just putting you know the the 
you know, blocks of pixels in there, and they were just kind of floating around. Um, so I took it back to the to the place where I bought it, and I said, "Hey, my character generator's out." I said, "How much? How much will that be to fix?" They looked at me and said, sixty dollars." I said, well, "Wait a minute, sixty dollars is the cost of a new one." They said, "Yeah, we're going to sell you a new one." Like, so you don't repair these? And nope, we don't repair them. What do you do with them? Take them, and throw them in the trash. Ah, okay. Well, in that case, if I'm going to spend money to buy a new one anyhow, let me have that Commodore 128. And uh, so I got the Commodore 128. Now, uh, it had the advantage of uh, being a, able to uh, run programs from a different system, so that was nice. And I actually started my college career uh, on a Commodore 128 with an old 9-pin printer. So from there, I then stepped up into the PC world, and uh, the PC that I bought way back when was a was a 386, and uh, it uh, it was the the bare bones 386, and uh, I, you know I installed a math coprocessor, I bought you know I installed more RAM. Um, the 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 first time I had it, I uh, or the first hard drive that was in it. A 40 megabyte hard drive, and uh, there was a program called Stacker that doubled the space of the hard drive, and uh, so it was a stacked hard drive. I had 80 megabytes. Good gosh, I had more room than I knew what to do with, and uh, you know, played games and wrote stuff, and I mean, just everything with that. And uh, I, I essentially built that computer. The only thing that I didn't change in that box. By the time it was all said and done, was the power supply and the case. Everything else in that computer, I swapped out, changed out, upgraded. Um, just, you know, I learned about computers on that thing. Now, the other thing that I learned about PCs, uh, Windows products and Windows operating systems, it, is that they are driver dependent and uh, trying to ensure every time you had an upgrade or did something to it that you had the right drivers and you know you could uh everything worked together properly it was like it it was the start of an eventual nightmare now i have been through oh i don't know uh, probably a half a dozen pcs laptops etc plus i do this at work as well you know uh you know part of my job at, at one point was doing that as well um, struggling with the operating system and, and drivers and getting everything to work was just, I'm sorry, it was just, it, at the time it was like, okay, this is, this is the way it is and this is, it doesn't get any better and, you know, that's just, that's just life. Okay, fair enough. And then along came an iPad. That's where it all started. So I'm sitting there with an iPad and uh, life is good. And my, it was my wife's iPad, and she wanted a, uh, a wireless keyboard for it. Now, I had, you know, in the past, uh, the, the boot process on my, on my laptop would literally take 20 minutes um, by the time everything is up and running and everything else. And, and then if I wanted to print something, I mean, the, the print drivers for the printer were lost somewhere in, in PC La La Land. Uh, probably four, four or five times in three years, and the problem is, is that every time I reloaded the printer drivers, it would load as copy one, which means the original copy was somewhere there. It was just corrupted, um, and it, it wasn't usable, and it's just frustrating stuff like that. So, on to the uh, to the iPad. I go to the Apple Store and I buy a wireless keyboard, a little Apple wireless keyboard. And uh, I walk in the house, and I pull the little plastic tab to uh, to activate the battery and uh, turn it on. Now, the computer is sitting there, char you know, the, the, the iPad is sitting there charging. And uh, it's, it's not even turned on. And so I walk up, and I'm in the same room. And I pull the tab for the battery and, and you know, just kind of looking at the, at the keyboard. And all of a sudden, I notice that the, the iPad has come to life. And I look at the iPad, and there's this little message on the screen that says, I detect a wireless keyboard. Would you like to associate that keyboard with this device? So I hit yes. And that was it. That was the installation. And I'm, I'm, I was standing there with my mouth agape literally in awe as to the ease, the absolute ease of that system. 
And I thought, holy cow, that's, uh, that's good stuff. And so as we started working more and more with iPads and iPhones and, and everything else, I, I kind of kept an eye on how easy things were. And, you know, there's a lot of people that complain that, that Apples are, you know, they're locked down and you can only use certain things on them and, you know, Apple controls it. Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is, is that everything works together in a relatively seamless fashion. And I'm at the age that I'm sorry. I just, I just want things to work. Yeah, I don't want to have to fight with them. I don't want to have to fiddle fart around with them or play with them or, you know, figure out what driver goes where to get something to do its job. I just want the dang thing to work. And so after, oh goodness, I think I've been looking at at Macs and, you know, laptops and and things like that for, uh, I don't know four years, five years. It's been a long time. And uh, so finally, uh, I looked at the, uh, I, I ended up getting a little Mac uh, laptop. And uh, I'm here to tell you, you know, you power it up and it turns on instantly or, you know, relatively instantly. The other day I had a, a paper that my son wanted to print up and he gave me the stick. And just to give you an example, he gave me the stick. I walked up to my to my uh, Apple computer, turned it on, um, put the stick in, uh, hooked up the printer. It had already, you know, it went online and said, "Would you like to install this printer?" It went and found the drivers, and in less time than it would take my PC to boot up, I had the printed copies of paper in my hand. Um, I had handed everything back to my son, and the laptop was turned back off. It was just phenomenal. It was it's like holy cow that that's that's so quick. I really I don't even know how to act. <laughs> it, it really was phenomenal. So the uh, the experience that I have that that I've had with that uh, with that laptop has been well. Just fabulous. It, it really has. Things are uh, are easy. Um, the the one thing that I've run into that I haven't had time to uh, to mess around with yet is that all my old episodes are saved to an external hard drive, and uh, all my old files and everything are saved to an external hard drive. And the external hard drive is in a format that uh, for the uh, Windows computer. Now the Apple computer will read to it, but it will not write to it. So I need to get another. Uh, what I want to do is I want to get a uh, a better uh, hard drive, uh, external hard drive, and uh, set it up for possibly for uh, for both, so that I can uh, I can use it going back and forth, and uh, that would be very convenient. Because one of the things that I've run into that is convenient for me is doing my YouTube videos on uh, Movie Maker which is a Windows product. Um, I haven't figured out, I haven't taken the time to, uh, to figure out the, uh, the Apple's movie thing to, uh, to do my, uh, uh, my, my YouTube stuff there. So, uh, you know, I still have the, uh, the, the, the PC. It's just a matter of uh, getting everything set up and, and figured out the way I want it. But uh, so far, quite honestly, I have been nothing but impressed with, uh, with the Apple products that, that I own. The only issue that I really have is uh, is the battery life on my iPhone, which is, you know, it's a couple years old and the battery life is gone. And uh, it sure would be nice if the batteries were uh, were more easily replaceable. Um, that's uh, that, that would be the only caveat that I would have about Apple products. And, you know, it's one of those things as phones get thinner and thinner and more and more integrated and compact and all that, you know, you... You kind of look at that and you think to yourself, okay, is that the cost of, of that technology advance is to uh, make it a little less user-friendly? Eh, maybe. But uh, anyhow, that's a report on the computing front. I, I know I'm behind on my YouTube videos, and uh, I hope to get that up to uh, up to speed and fixed here uh, uh, in the near future. And uh, But, you know, in the meantime, I am thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying my new computer. bit of a rainy day today, and uh, 
well, it's not a bad thing unless it turns really, really cold, um, in which case it uh, it could be bad, especially in low-lying areas where water collects. So it's one of those things that, uh, you know, do you know? Do you know where the water collects on your uh, on your route to work, for example? Have you ever paid attention to that? Have you, have you ever looked and said, hmm, water collects here. If it freezes, it may be a bad situation. Just a question, just to try to find out, you know, how, um, I don't know, it's, it, it's kind of an academic exercise to uh, find out how cognizant are you of your surroundings? How aware are you of what's going on? Do you look for certain things? Do you look for things that are, well, potentially dangerous? It's just a question. Anyhow, the uh, I think about the weirdest things when I drive to work in the morning. Anyhow, the shave of the day this morning, um, I use Dr. John's again, and I use the classic. Now, the the classic, it was, uh, it lathered just wonderfully. I used my Omega Boar Brush, and uh, it's starting to get a little softer, I suppose, but uh, I, that or else I'm just getting used to it. <laughs> um the uh the the classic uh, lathered very very nicely i took a picture of it that'll probably be the uh the the, the picture for the uh for the podcast this week just to show you since i have talked on multiple occasions how that big old brush just sucks in the soap and uh i think this uh this the the picture that i took this morning probably displays that reasonably well to at least get the idea across so uh so it did again. Um, the the classic. It smelled. I don't know. Minty. Uh, you know. It's uh, that that was the biggest thing. It was. It wasn't like overpowering minty. It was just well minty and with a little bit of menthol in it. And just. I mean, that's that's the the first impression smell that I got out of it. Um, it it shaved nice. I mean, it uh, just like all the Dr. Johns, it was a very uh, nice, thick, uh, rather luxurious lather. Um, you know, it was interesting. After uh, yesterday's shave, which was a four-pass BBS shave, I found this morning that uh, I really didn't have a whole lot of, I mean, I didn't have a whole lot of stubble to shave off. It was... Uh, it was rather uh, curious, you know. I I could easily see where uh, you know you could almost go a day or two uh, without shaving after having a a very good BBS shave, and uh, it was just uh, it, it was curious. It it brought me back to the times when you know men would go to the barber shop and uh, and get a shave well every other day, and and I can understand that. That uh, that makes sense. It's uh, and it's probably good for the skin at that point too, because you know every other day it gives everything time to heal, and uh, probably was a rather luxurious experience. Anyhow, the uh, I uh, I continued to use the uh, the Gillette Silver Blue and the uh, Tech Fat Handle, and again, uh, good, good job there. It's uh, it's uh, really really nice. So I have enjoyed the, uh, the 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 shaves that I have gotten with that. I think I'll try uh, one more out of it, and uh, maybe two, and uh, call it a full week worth of shaves, and then I'll probably dust bin it. Or the other thing is, I could potentially uh, sit there and and see just how many I could get out of it. Nah, I'd rather uh, keep the. Uh, keep the, uh, the 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 idea that they are truly a luxurious shave because well they are i i have enjoyed them um very smooth very nice shaves so uh so far so good that's the shave of the day so here we are in the wilds of the upstate of south carolina and there is this well, this this stuff that is falling out of the sky, it's it's like white. I don't know what it is. I haven't seen it before. It's I, I've heard them call it something. I can't remember what was the name again. Snow. Yeah, that's what they called it. They called it snow. I have no idea what it is. Um, <laughs> actually, it is a bit of a uh, a snow, not much, a light dusting at best. Um, of course, they were calling for you know an inch. And, you know, all the all the stores emptied out immediately of milk and bread. Lord knows, don't know what you're going to do with milk and bread, but but the stores emptied out of milk and bread. Anyhow, 
And, uh, well, there you go. It's <laughs> The roads are clear. It's, uh, I don't know, it's right at freezing, thereabouts, 31 degrees. And uh, so the roads are pretty clear. It's uh, pretty good shape. Light dusting of snow on the ground. Life is good. Now, if it snows tonight, well, the ground may be cold enough that it may, uh, may be a little bit slippery tomorrow. But, uh, but for right now, it's, uh, it's in really good shape. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the forecast is that uh, it will be 36 degrees sometime today. And uh, once it warms up, uh, well, everything disappears, the snow's clean, you know, the, the, the roads clear up again, and uh, life goes on. But meanwhile, people are uh, driving around like maniacs and uh, having a good time and uh, wrecking and ending up in the ditch. And yeah, it's, it's like that. I just, I don't understand it, but that's what happens. <laughs> okay. Shave of the day. The shave of the day today was uh, Dr. John's The Big Green Monster. Um, that's, hmm, it's a weird scent. Um, it's got a little bit of menthol in it, or at least I felt a little bit of menthol in it. And it's got a little bit of lime and a little bit of citrus. And it's just <sighs> Big Green Monster. It was I don't know, just strange. Now the uh, so so I'm I'm still experimenting with it. Great lather, okay. Again, excellent lather. I, I used the big Omega brush again, and uh, I did something a little bit different. Instead of adding the typical one teaspoon of water, I added two. I figured, well, maybe that'll be the secret to unlocking the lather potential of the brush. And uh, sure enough, it uh, it did much better. It uh, it gave a really nice lather. Still, it still had most of it in the brush, but there was actually some uh, some lather in the bowl as well. Um, so that was uh, that was nice. I will uh, continue to uh, to play around with the water content, and uh, th that's one thing that I've noticed. Sometimes you do need to play around with the water content depending on what brush you're using. So sometimes it's not necessarily soap dependent. Sometimes it is in fact brush dependent. Um, at least that's been my experience. So something to keep in mind if you have a soap that's not reacting quite right. Uh, if you're using the same brush, you know, you can vary the water quality up and down to kind of play with it and see, uh, see what makes it tick. And then, of course, if you turn around and change brushes, you may have to, uh, to do things, well, just a little bit different, again, to uh, see what makes things tick. It's all about variables. <laughs> and there's a lot of them. So uh, that was the shave today. It's, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, this, this happened. Um, I used my, uh, my fat handle tech, and uh, I, you know, just it's still using the same uh, Gillette Silver Blue blade in it, having a glorious time with that, uh, with that razor and that blade combination. It's, uh, it's really nice. So I've gotten, uh, what, six shaves out of that thing at this point, and uh, it's really done a good job. And uh, I was doing underneath my chin in, uh, you know, well, under the, uh, under the jawline there, which uh, sometimes is problematic to me. And uh, the blade is definitely on its last hurrah. It, uh, it did not cut uh, as, as cleanly as it should have. So, uh, you know, I'm not, it, it's interesting. I'm not seeing a, uh, a degradation of the blade in terms of tugging or pulling or nicks or anything like that, it just doesn't cut as well. And so it leaves stuff behind. Um, so that, that's curious. It's, uh, it, when, it, when it falters, it, it falters gently, I guess is the best way to put it, um, which, is, which is, well, nice. Um, you know, it's still very much a socially acceptable shave. It's uh, not BBS, but uh, very much socially acceptable. And uh, so I was happy with that. Now, the thing that, uh, that I wanted to report was that when I do under my jawline, what I'll do is, is I will take the head of the razor, and I won't use the whole head of the razor because, well, you can't get in there anyhow, so I'll do it in segments. So right at the jawline, it'll be like a third of the head of the razor. And then, um, you know, I'll go in a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper, and I'll kind of concentrate on just that, that edge, if you will, that, that third of the head, not under the handle, but the part that overhangs the handle, actually doing the cutting. And to a certain extent, you can see that effect 
um, in the lather in the soap on your on your neck as you're going you'll see places where the soap is you know not really disturbed it's not you know scraped away it's uh, just kind of redistributed maybe but uh, it, it gives you an indication of where the blade is actually cutting so you know that's how I do it and uh, seems to work okay so it's um, it's it's kind of the law of chance, I guess. So I was doing that, and of course the blade is you know a little bit uh, a little bit worn. It's got some age on it. It's got a few shaves on it. it. Needs to be changed out. Okay, I get that. So I'm shaving away, and uh, and I'm putting enough pressure on it, and all of a sudden the head busts loose of the handle. Now when I say bust loose, it's the the screw threads come undone because I just happen to have the the, the razor oriented in exactly the right rotation, you know, the the right angle, the right direction, everything else. So that and I've got just enough pressure on it and just the right angle on it and the head just starts spinning. <laughs> and in I don't know, it's been easily 2 years uh that I've been wet shaving. I've never had that happen. <laughs> and I thought to myself, aha, I have found one weakness of the Gillette Tech or the, uh, the other uh, three-piece razors of the Tech design where, uh, you know, if you're, if you're pressing just right, the, uh, the, the head can come unscrewed off the handle while in use. <laughs> uh, no nicks or cuts or anything like that, and, uh, but uh, it did kind of... It kind of uh, struck me as both funny and humorous and, <laughs> well, different all at the same time. The Tale of the Cowboy Boots. Okay, so many years ago, when I first started with the company that I work for, I, uh, I was a... Uh, a frequent attendee, if you will, of country western bars. I just happen to enjoy them. I like country western music. Um, I enjoyed the people. I enjoyed, well, at the time, uh, the girls. Um, you know, it's just human nature. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, I uh, I had a a pair of, well, actually a couple of pairs of uh, nice uh, western boots, and. In the company that I worked for, there were uh, I was on the road to advancement, and there was one advancement that I had been working hard to attain. And uh, within the particular field that I was working in, it was uh, essentially the, the the pinnacle of that field, or at least the uh, the expectation. So that was kind of the uh, the, the the watershed mark of uh, of that uh, particular career path at the time. And when I attained that level, I, uh, I went out and splurged. And I splurged on a pair of Tony Llama boots. Now, the Tony Llama boots that I had, had uh, they were two-tone. They were kind of a light brown with, a, uh, with kind of a, a brown uh, lizard or snake tip. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's real or if it's just embossed, but it was a, a very nice-looking boot. And uh, at the time, uh, I paid a bunch of money for this silly pair of boots. And to me, it was well worth it because it was a celebration. And so first off, um, I, would, uh, I would recommend highly that uh, as you go through life, as you attain certain things that are goals that you set for yourself, celebrate them. Celebrate them in a fashion that will be memorable, you know, um, whether that's buying a piece of clothing, buying a piece of gear, uh, you know, going out, uh, you know, going and visiting someplace like, uh, I don't know, going to a, a, a big town, staying in a hotel and just laying around and ordering room service. Do something to celebrate the fact that you have attained your goal because it is a big deal, and you need to make it a big deal. Okay, so I went out and bought this pair of boots. Now, at the time, my feet were of a certain size. And, uh, and so I bought these boots, and I wore these boots, and I dearly loved these boots. 
And then I got sent overseas. Now, when I was overseas, I did not take my boots. I put them in storage. And in the process of being overseas, I, for the period of about three years, pretty much walked everywhere. I mean, that was just the mode of transportation. Everywhere that I needed to go, I walked. I walked all the time. I would walk for miles. I mean, it was just, that's what you did. Um, and in the process, my foot size changed. I don't know if things loosened up, if, uh, if my arch fell a little bit. I, I don't know. But the, my, my foot size changed. So I get back, and much to my chagrin, to my just, uh, I was devastated, my boots, my Tony Llama boots, my celebratory boots, no longer fit. I was heartbroken. Those boots languished in my closet for probably 10 years before I finally gave them away or got rid of them. I might have given them to Goodwill or something like that. But it was 10 years, and it hurt to get rid of those boots because they meant so much to me. They were an attainment of a goal. So, the other day, I was perusing around eBay like I do on occasion and just happened to think, well, I wonder if they got any leather boots. And, uh... You know, part of it's because I'd been watching Westerns and, you know, thinking about it and just, okay, so I started looking at Western boots. And lo and behold, much to my surprise, there is advertised a pair of vintage, okay, so I'm vintage, <laughs> a pair of vintage Tony Llama boots of the exact same style as the ones that I had in the correct size. So I waited and I waited. And in the final moments, I placed my bid, and I won said boots. I received those boots the other day, and uh, first off, the, uh, the, the, the boots look like they have, had not been worn much. Um, so I'm in the process of, of slowly uh, uh, stretching them just a, a touch to, uh, to fit my feet correctly, kind of the, the break-in period, if you will. Ah, gosh, these things are, I love these boots. There is something about a nice piece of leather. Um, I don't care if it's a boot, if it's a wallet, if it's a strop, if it's a leather bag. There is something about a nice piece of leather that just, I, I really, really like. It's the same thing and it's the same feel that I get for a beautiful piece of of wood. And that piece of wood can be a large thing, like, well, a grand piano, for example, or it can be a small thing, like a shaving brush. There is something about a beautiful, a beautifully grained, a beautifully finished piece of wood that just, I don't know, has an intrinsic quality that draws me. It's, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm different that way, but uh, I do enjoy those things. You know, when I, I, throughout my whole life, for example, I have been just intrigued, absolutely intrigued to the, to the point of study, wooden boats. The interiors of wooden boats, the manufacture of wooden boats, all the pieces, parts, and how they go together, the joints and the and and the parts and and the you know all of that it's just uh fascinating absolutely fascinating leather is another thing you know the the manufacture of leather the 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 traditional methods of making buckskin and and rawhide and and things like that and and you know to end up with a finished product and and the the nice uh you know harness leathers and and things like that that are available and tooling leathers and it's just it's it, there is something about it that is just it's artwork and it's even though it is an inanimate object it still has at its being a certain life a certain small piece of 
of soul still. I mean, that, that's just the way I feel. <laughs> I'm probably very, very odd in that regard, but that is, in fact, the way I feel. So I get these boots, and the first thing I do is I look at them, and I'm surprised because, well, they're they're better than the pictures. And then I proceed to uh, take some Obanoff's leather conditioner and uh, condition these things up and put them on and, you know, just kind of sit around in them and just let them get used to my feet and let my feet get used to them. And, you know, I'll do a little bit more each day and stretch them a little bit here and there to, to, to where they... Uh, they need to be, and in the end, I'll end up with another pair of boots that, well, that has a story behind it. And I think that's part of the fun, is uh, having things that have stories behind them. For some reason, they're just, they're more, I don't know, precious. It's just, it's just one of those things. coffee. Need to talk about coffee. Coffee is, well, it's special. It's a, it's a ritual almost. It's, um, it's something for, for those that, that make coffee. I just, you know, it's not just brewing a pot of coffee. I mean, everybody can do that. You know, you go get some ground beans, you throw it in a pot, boom, done. Okay. Then there are those who get, you know, stuff that's already ground and they uh, they take it and they might put it in a coffee pot, a drip percolator, or a French press, you know, something like that, um, a vacuum percolator, you know, a, a vacuum system, whatever. It's uh, it, There's a little bit more to it once you surround yourself with uh, the, you know, certain pieces of equipment and an understanding of how to use that equipment. Then there's those that go a little bit further and buy roasted beans. And with those roasted beans, grind their own coffee and, and then proceed to, with whatever apparatus they have to brew their coffee, whether it's a pour-over or a French press or something like that, um, proceed to, well, make coffee. Not just, not just brew a pot, but make coffee there there's something i don't know about it you're you're doing more than just creating a beverage it's it like i said it's very much a ritual um makes me think to a certain extent uh, a, a little bit of the preparation that goes into the japanese green tea ceremonies you know it's uh there's there's something there now then there's there's those of us who have, you know, kind of like shaving, gone off the deep end, and, well, we not only make coffee and grind our own beans, but we also roast our own beans. And to me, anyhow, it is, it's a way, quite honestly, for me to gauge how stressed my life is. Okay, what do I mean by that? The way that I gauge my stress with coffee is that if I am really stressed out and busy and just bouncing around, I don't have time, or I don't take time, let's put it that way, to roast my own beans, grind my own beans, and make coffee. I'll go the easy route. I'll get stuff that's, you know, I'll either get beans and grind them up or I'll get pre-ground stuff. Or every now and then, if I'm really in a bad way, I'll, I'll uh, grab one of my wife's dreaded K-cups. <laughs> uh, but essentially what you end up with at the end of the day is, well, nothing short of a beverage. It's it's, I mean, that's all it is. It becomes very utilitarian, which is, well, to some degree, exactly what drove us away from the shaving routine into traditional wet shaving. At least it is for me. Because it, it had become just utilitarian. And, and that, to a certain extent, was what coffee was as well. And so the the ritual of being able to 
roast my own beans, grind my own coffee, and, and make, not just brew, but, but make coffee is, well, again, a way to gauge how hectic my life is. It, it's been a while since I've roasted my own beans. I've been bouncing back and forth. Job has been stressed out. Things have been going on. It's just I've been all over the place. And so it was this weekend that I actually sat down and roasted my own beans again. Roasted some Costa Rican coffee beans. And just the, the, the ritual of, you know, personally, I roast mine in a cast iron pan on a little propane stove on the back porch. You know, I, I don't have a a an expensive roaster or, you know, anything that is uh, has timers involved or computer controlled this or that. There's no electricity. It's just a, a cast iron pan, a source of heat, because I can do it over a wood fire just as easily, and the beans and a spoon. I mean, that's that's it in a nutshell. And then, a, you know, a, a, a pan or something, a cookie sheet to uh, let them cool down when I'm done. And, and it's all done by eye. And what I noticed while I was out on the back porch roasting my coffee beans is, is first off, I, I decided to, to slow things down a little bit, turn the heat down just a touch, and, and just enjoy the experience and, you know, wait for the first crack. And, and as soon as I heard the, the sound of popcorn, it's, aha, the first crack. And, you know, you lower the heat down just a little bit more while you continuously stir and and I look around and I realize that, well, it's a beautiful day out and and the air is fresh and clean and pure and, well, I'm rather happy to be there in that moment right then. And I can feel the stress sliding away. And then as the, as the beans continue to roast and, and the smoke from the oils of the beans starts to, to emanate from the cast iron pan and it's wafting up into the into the screen porch where I'm where I'm roasting my beans and it's it's covering everything and yes there is the pungent smell of smoke but there's also a a warmth and envelopment and and kind of a, a close feel to it all almost like the coffee smoke is giving me a big hug and it's just it's comforting it's comforting to know that that things have have quieted down enough to, to give me the time, to give me the opportunity to, to roast my coffee beans. And then as my, my roast gets to about where I want it, just shy of dark, kind of a, a medium roast, and again, it's, it's in a cast iron pan, so it's not even. It's not meant to be even, at least not within the cast iron pan. It's supposed to be a tad spotty, and some beans are dark, and some beans are just brown and and you know it it's well it's that way it's diversity of of flavors and and profiles and and it's it's right there in the pan and then i turn off the heat toss the beans out onto the cookie sheet to cool and as they give up the last the last traces of their of their smoke and cool down and and calm down I can feel myself calming with them. I can feel myself just exhaling, the stress leaving my body the same way that the smoke is, is leaving the coffee beans. And it just, it feels good, and it feels right, and it's enjoyable. And to a certain extent, when I stop and look back on the event, it's very similar to, well, shaving in that I can feel the relaxation of the ritual of the, you know, whipping up the lather, of loading the brush, whipping up the lather, applying the lather to face, and, and stopping a moment and taking a deep breath before I bring the blade into play, and allowing everything just to, just to set in that time, in that place, and, and calmly reflect Reflect on what life should be, whether it's a, a shave or whether it's a, a coffee bean. It's really amazing when you think about it that I can 
take those two things that some people would say are completely opposite, that have nothing in common with each other, but in fact they do because it's the ritual that we surround ourselves with that allows us to relax and face the day. And, and I must admit that the first cup of coffee from those freshly roasted Costa Rican beans was, well, exhilarating, flavorful, tasty, and again, calming, rather reflective. So, if you are one of one of us that makes coffee and instead of just brewing a pot or brewing a, a cup here or there, um, you get the same enjoyment out of it? Do you have the same ritualistic behaviors? Whether it is as, you know, it's it's interesting because in a way it's it's very similar, you know, the the number of rotations the uh, of when, while you're loading a brush the number of you know the the exact amount of water uh, the uh you know the the the, the same ritual the, the the same blade patterns every time you shave the the count on the number of of shaves that a blade has you know you can go very much overboard in details and record keeping and and everything when it comes to shaving and there are some people, and don't get me wrong, I believe that in these instances they obtain great shaves and they obtain great cups of coffee. Again, I'm not that way. I play things by ear. <laughs> I throw what, well, what I think are enough coffee beans in the grinder, and I pour in what I think is about the right amount of water, and things are, well, much less measured and much more, well, by feel. Very similar to, in a lot of respects, to the way that I shave. Things are very much by feel. And, and you know, when things look right, well, that's that's when I stop. And, and when things, you know, just kind of seem to be appropriate, that's what I do. And it's it's not... It's not necessarily a scientific endeavor, whether it's shaving or making coffee for me, but it is a relaxing endeavor. It is, well, a bit ritualistic. And it is a way for me to gauge my stress. Because after a very nice shave and after a very good cup of home-roasted coffee, I truly can enter the day just stress-free. Now. I may have all kinds of stresses when I get going. There's no doubt that, that that will probably occur. But at least I've entered the fray calmly with a great deal of understanding as to who I am, where I am, and to a certain extent why I'm here. And that just helps. That, that that helps make me understand that, yes, there are stresses in the world, but one of the reasons that I am here is because I have the capability and capacity to deal with those stresses where others potentially don't. I have strengths that I bring to the table, and, and well, I have a, a much more calmer ability to reflect on what those are so that they can be brought to bear at the appropriate time and in the appropriate manner so that I can be successful. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing what something as simple as a shave or making coffee can do. Well, that concludes this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you have some suggestions or would like a topic covered, drop me an email at brushandsoapandblade at gmail.com or give me a call at 864-372-6234 or contact us on Twitter at Brush and Blade. You can also visit us at our blog, brushandsoapandblade.wordpress.com. As always, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher.